Ladies and gentlemen, so uh, I'll, basically my case is Poland and Ukraine. And I think the reason why we are looking at this very case is can be summarized in the snapshots in these two uh, from these two articles from the venerable uh, Guardian Daily of the of the UK. So on the left, you have the uh, allegedly neo-Nazi militias in Ukraine walking with torches, always a fantastic, uh, fantastic image. And then on the right, you have allegedly 60,000 nationalists walking in downtown Warsaw at the country's independence march, which is happening every, every, every November for quite a few, quite a few years. So this is the kind of, let's say, backdrop to our discussions and our conversations. And let me tackle case, it case on a case by case basis. And let me start with Poland. So in Poland, uh, there are three phenomena that we need to look at really quickly and which are quite often seen as interconnected and quite often seen as mixing and intermingling. But in reality, they do not always exist in happy harmony with one another. And sometimes we get the image of Poland on the far right and paramilitary scene a bit wrong. And I'll try to you know, correct it in, in certain ways and actually show you the, 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 the true underbelly and the true worry that we should have vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis this scene and this country. So, you have three issues. First is far right, second is paramilitarism, and the third is the radical right politics. These three are supposedly converging together, but in reality, that's not always the case. So the Poland's far right. Many say that it peaks around 2015 and afterwards when the refugee crisis starts, when there is a change of government in Poland, and certain individuals who have nationalist far right views come to the fore, and they march down Warsaw in tens of thousands, and they terrorize Warsaw, and it looks really scary on the images that I've just shared with you. Whereas in reality, the history of the far right in Poland is a bit more complicated. So the far right in Poland has a history of kind of internal struggles between the men in suits and the men who do not want to wear suits. So I would say the politicos and the militants. And this struggle has been going on for 20 years. And in those 20 years, the struggle between those two groups animated the Melie, the scene, and it always gave it a kind of like a shot in the arm. Uh, in a sense. And this milieu, I think it actually peaks way before 2015. It peaks maybe even a decade ago when there are competing marches happening in different parts of Poland. And one, actually the one you see in Warsaw is the less radical one. There is a more radical one happening in the south of Poland in the city of Wrocław, which attracts far less attention, which is not covered by international media, but it's way more, uh, way more ugly. So this is just a point of information. So the far right had been there before. Then you have paramilitarism. Now, there is a paramilitary boom, true, which happens around 2014, 2015, in relation to the war in Ukraine, when there is a bottom-up, let's say, surge of individuals who want to join paramilitary organizations to basically prepare themselves for what they see as a possibility of a hybrid warfare waged by Russia to be bested upon Poland. Then there is a state-owned initiative to own this paramilitary surge, and these two, in a way, come together. But this, this surge happens in parallel, not at the same time, not mixed with the far right boom, and it's separate, separate from it. And at the same time, the paramilitaries have always been part, you know, part and parcel of the social fabric of Poland, and they've existed for quite a few, uh, quite a few years. It's just in 2014-15, they became popular, widely popular, with all sorts of regular people. The third element is that you know, there is a conservative government that comes to power in late 2015, and this, this kind of coincides with the refugee crisis, with the paramilitary boom, with those marches in Warsaw getting bit and, you know, and more and more an expo of exposure in international media. And this is allegedly the last element of the puzzle that puts together a kind of a perfect storm. You have a government that allegedly tries to co-opt this march, that tries to co-opt this feeling and tries to co-opt the far right, the nationalists, and basically some say things the same as they do. This is a simplistic analysis. Yes, the government might electorally want to own both the suits and the non-suits of the far right, but it would be simplistic to call them one and the same. So in these conditions, the big question that we really have to ask, and I'm really you know, trying to you know, distill it to a, to a kind of like a one pill for everyone to take so that they get an understanding of what's happening in the country. The big question we really have to ask is, is there a case? So essentially, the paramilitarism in the country, as I told you, exists separately of the far right. And in reality, and as I've spoken to some of the nationalists in the country, they themselves were telling me, you know, there is paramilitarism, of course, but this paramilitarism is more in the mainstream. 
it is more in the center left center right media which are saying look we need to be ready to face of russia we are outside this river of paramilitarism which starts to flow in 2014 in 2015 and a really funny one poland's nationalist poland's far right is kind of pro-russian if you can imagine that now the paramilitary boom is basically being stood up it happens because of russia but also against Russia, of course, not directly, but indirectly, kind of subconsciously. That puts these two phenomena at odds. In a sense, you know, paramil paramilitaries are hobbyists. They're not ideologues and they're not politicians, and they don't always coexist very, very well together. Of course, the fight milieu does stage summer camps. It does train its members. It uses the multifaceted, the massive private-owned infrastructure, which basically comes into life in Poland after especially 2014 and 15, but it has been growing for at least two decades and caters to private citizens initiatives and also the state initiatives to own the, this paramili paramilitary boom. But as I said, this paramilitary boom is not essentially far right in nature. The far right organizations try to infiltrate this on a local level, but they're not extremely successful, successful in the process. Now, the question is, is Polish scene, which has a viable political infrastructure, and it's a growing and multifaceted and metastasizing far-right scene, can be a magnet, magnet for outsiders, for externals. And it is. It is, but not on a paramilitary, paramilitary plateau, on a paramilitary level. It is a magnet on a political level. You know, you can go to war, so you can hang out with these guys, something which you wouldn't be doing in the earlier years, because the scenes from Scandinavia, Germany, UK, places like that, the, the far right scenes would be looking down on the Eastern Europeans and they wouldn't even think of visiting places like Poland for any political fraternal activities. Now it is basically on everyone's menu. It is basically on everyone's calendar. It is cool to do so because allegedly you can come to Poland, which in some eyes is basically some kind of a far right Shangri-La when you can feel like yourself, you can be yourself. It is, it is a traditional Christian place where you will not encounter certain elements of social life that you would encounter in Western Europe. I mean, allegedly, it's all, uh, it's all in inverted commas. So my main kind of argument for Poland, it is politics still that outweighs paramilitarism. However, there is, as I said, a vibrant paramilitary structure, you know, infrastructure, which is privately owned. And this is my worry. This is something that we should be worrying in the longer term, the free market. There are organizations in Poland, and as I will uh, tell you in a second in Ukraine as well, which basically cater to the, uh, to the kind of free market, uh, free market approach where you can basically come in and try to buy training for yourself in these, with these paramilitary se security academies who are not essentially far right. They're not really far right. They're not ideological. But since they open up to almost anyone, they are a worry. Let us move to Ukraine, the next case, and let me briefly address this. This is a, you know, this is a completely different, for, different uh, far-right scene. It's paramilitary because they, these guys are veterans. They're veterans of the war. They fought in the war. It's key to their understanding and being of, of themselves that they, of course, are proud of their achievements and their accomplishments. But it is also a political far-right scene. If you ask Ukrainian experts and people on the ground, they do not perceive the far-right organizations as paramilitary. You know, they see them more as political. Of course, they know that there is a paramilitary, paramilitary past and a paramilitary, paramilitary angle, but they perceive them more as politicals. And these politicals are sometimes bewildered by some of the accusations coming, you know, from the likes of us, that from 2014 onwards, you would have, you know, you know those swastika tattoos, those Wolfsang angle logos, the flags and the guns of the Azov battalion slash regiment and other uh, allegedly far-right militias in Ukraine. And these constitute some kind of like a, you know, laboratory for international white supremacy, to quote from one uh, pretty influential op-ed in the, in the New York Times. That's not the case, and let me tell you why. What we see in the Ukrainian scene, what is visible, is something that you saw on the 10th of April. On the 10th of April, the Azov movement or the National Corps, its political party, organized the paramilitary training outside Kiev, where actually anyone having a gun license could join the veterans of the Azov, Azov regiment, regiment to train in case there is an eventuality of another war with Russia. And Ukraine has to be prepared. It's Ukraine, Ukrainian citizens have to be prepared for any eventuality. That's why they organize things like that. That's what you see. 
What you don't see is the internal training of these groups, of the political paramilitary groups, if I could put it this way, where they definitely train with one another to basically you know, hone their skills. And what's certainly what we don't see from abroad or what we rarely see, but I tried, I got a sneak peek while actually uh, researching this very, this, very, this very feature is the business element. You know, paramilitarism in Ukraine is a business. You can essentially hire them as a private security company. You can hire them as a muscle and you can use them in your political or business disputes. And don't get me wrong, this is something that has been present in Ukraine for ages, way before the war, but it was more disorganized. You know, if you're familiar with the word Tituski, uh, you know, the uh, thugs dressed in, in, in tracksuits who would beat up your opponents, this is now way more serious. You know, it's uniforms, it's guns, it's tactical gear, it just looks more scary. And the thing is, is it a magnet for outsiders? You know, it still is. Outsiders can come in and the, the likes of Die Zeit did reporting on this. The outsiders can come in and as Mr. Heinze uh, mentioned, they, come in, they can come in and do something which is uh, equivalent of the training that I mentioned in point one, the more public one, the lower skills, so to speak, so to speak one, the easier one. And there are organizations, you know, there is infrastructure locally, regionally, there are veterans who would do it for, for you. But so far, my interviewees in Ukraine were saying that they haven't seen the infrastructure used in point two and three to actually use, uh, use the foreigners. And sometimes for, in certain cases, that's a big disappointment for the foreigners who are visiting Ukraine. So as a conclusion, I would say this, there is a forest and certainly there are trees. And the trees are the far right scenes in both Poland and, and, and Ukraine, which are pretty vibrant. But in certain cases, you know, we would probably have to accept that we might be barking at the wrong tree, up the wrong tree in this in this case, because in the you know in the Polish far right scene, which I said has a pretty pretty big infrastructure and growing and metastasizing infrastructure, paramilitarism is not the issue. It might look ugly to you from the photos of the demonstrations on the March of Independence, but it's not really sometimes what you see at the first glance. At the same time, there is vibrant paramilitary infrastructure in Ukraine, but it is not yet used for the benefit of the externals en masse. There were individual cases, of course, and I can talk about that more in the Q&A, but it's not yet a massive issue. I think the more immediate issue is the free market, that these organizations, the, inf the paramilitary infrastructure in both countries, can be used and abused in some way by the private companies, which are not perfectly regulated and controlled, which basically can open up to externals who might get in provided that they pay for it with the right money. And again, I can give you examples of such individuals coming from the international far right milieu to the countries. But again, not a massive case, but potentially a growing market that we should be wor worried about. And the mid to long term issue, it's connected to the previous point. What if these infrastructures that do exist, that metastasize, that are sometimes misused by political actors which are, which are anti-democratic, radical, et cetera, et cetera. Imagine a world in which these would be perfectly and fully used for that purpose, but they're not. But however, I think we need to plan for also in certain cases or in many cases for the worst eventuality. And I think this would be like my final point. So you've got the more immediate issue, which is not yet 100% connected or not connected with the far right, but you've got the mid to, to, to long-term issue, which is way more worrying to us you know, who study the far right issues in, in, in the region. But as I said, not yet on the cards, but I think we need to watch and monitor the situation pretty closely. And I'll stop here, happy to take questions in this session and at the end of the event. Thank you very much.